multi-axis spindle turning. The name says it all. It's actually a spindle turning on a multiple axis. Let's talk axis first. We have three types of axis. We have the central axis. That's the axis that we use to turn uh, the wooden material on the lathe when we are smoothing it out from its raw form into a cylindrical shape. Then we have two other types of axis, the parallel and the non-parallel or twisted axis. Those axes are actually having their name based on their relative position in relationship to the central axis. So therefore, if we turn the, the spindle turning on a parallel axis, that means that we are turning in an axis that is parallel to the spindle or central axis and those two will never cross each other. They run parallel to each other, there's no connection point ever. Also, the other way of turning multi-axis spindle turnings is using the twisted axis and there we have two subtypes of twisted axis. There can be a twisted axis that has a common cross point with the central axis. So they don't run parallel to the central axis. They can cross each other where one of the types is actually having a common cross point or they can cross each other visually, but there's no common cross point between the twisted axis and the central axis. So next thing that we can discuss is the outcomes. Outcomes are referring to the actual cross section that you're gonna end up after finishing the cutting on the new axis. There are two types of outcomes that you can get in a multi-axis spindle turning. One is the arc type and the other one is circular. In the arc type of an outcome, the cross section of the cut piece will be a set of arcs that are forming a closed shape where the circular outcome is actually getting a, a cross section that is a circle. There's another term that I will add to this and that is turning through air wood or ghost wood. When we're talking about air wood, turning air wood or ghost wood, we mean that the tool during the full circle of full rotation of the piece is only partially cutting through the wood and the rest of the time is actually traveling through air, not cutting anything. My first encounter with the multiple axis spindle turning happened on one of the summer workshops that my uh, club was hosting in the workshop of one of our members. His name is Arthur. And on the window in his uh, workshop, I saw a couple of samples of multi-axis uh, turnings. And I was uh, curious to know how those were made because that was my first time seeing them. Uh, the, what happened is that the little engineer in my head tried to uh, figure out that by just looking at them and that was not that easy. So then, triggered by that, I actually started doing my research and I started looking different uh, YouTube videos and have learned that basically the master of this technique at this point is Barbara Deal. So I saw a couple of her videos that were very informative and I also have learned that she has a book about multi-axis spindle turning. So what I did was I got that book, I started reading, I started like learning about the whole process and in this video I'll try to share the ways I'm doing things, the way I learned from all of that, show you what I know and I will put most uh, attention to a couple of pieces that I really like. One is a small uh, wooden cup that is turned on a three axis and also uh, two figurines, uh, one female and one male that are turned also on a multiple axis and I'm glad to say that uh, a pair of them actually got me a award on one of the last uh, 
woodworking expos that was held in my area before the COVID uh, happened. So since we have two types of uh, outcomes and two types of axis placement, there are four combinations that we can make out of them or four quadrants where all the pieces that we turn can get into. Uh, the first quadrant is if we use an arc type of an outcome and parallel axis. The second one is arc type of an outcome and a twisted axis. Third quadrant is circular type of outcome and parallel axis. And then the last one is a circular type of outcome and twisted axis. Uh, in this video I'll try to show at least one or two turn pieces that belong in each of those four quadrants and some of the pieces that I will show will actually be a combination of a different uh, elements that belong to different quadrants. I'll do a couple of multi-axis spindle turnings on parallel axis, on twisted axis, uh, the combination between them. So the piece that I started turning is <clears throat> belonging to the first quadrant. So it has two parallel axes labeled 1-1 one, one and 2-2 two, two, uh, for the headstock and tailstock connections. And it's part of the arc type of outcomes. So what happens here is we start turning it at the axis 1-1 one, one, and uh, we turn a big bead across the whole piece. Then we unmount the piece and remount it on the second set of axes 2-2, two, two, which are parallel to 1-1. One, one. And we, instead of doing a bead, now we are doing a cove. So that cove now is following the shape of the bead on the other side. And when those two curves meet, cross section, we have a closed shape made of two arcs because we used only two multi-axis. I have to apologize for the burlesque type of uh, video that I will be sharing with you now because I had so much material that I wanted to share and I had to fast forward through a lot of it so all in all, I had pretty much 19 hours of material that I had to squeeze in this available slot of one hour. So a lot of those will be fast forwarded, but also who wants to, to look someone uh, spindle turning in details. So stay with me and let's learn something about a multi-axis spindle turning. Also, when you're doing a multi-axis uh, spindle turning, there are only a couple of basic cuts that you're doing. We have making a cove, making a bead, V-cut, and planing cut. Those are pretty much the ones that we do throughout the uh, process of making the spindle form. So, it's not very complicated, it's easy, and it's always a combination of those. But for the basic pieces that I will be turning, I will be usually using only one of those forms or very uh, little of combination between a couple of them. I'm turning a piece with the archetype outcome and parallel axis where instead of only one bead and one cove on turn on different axis here on the first axis I'm doing a bead in the middle and two coves at the left and right and when I put it on the second set of axis I put a cove in the middle and two beads on the outside 
The cross section is again made out of two arcs because we're using only two axes. At the beginning of this video, uh, I did a couple of different types of uh, rough turning by using the roughing spindle gouge, which is for spindle turning only, not for ball turning. And also I used uh, my 40-40 uh, ball gouge and 40-40 spindle gouge. For the actual multi-axis spindle turning and applying the forms, I was mainly using only those two tools, the ball gouge 4040 for taking uh, the bulk of the material and to refining the forms I was using the spindle gouge uh, grinded with the 4040 grind or also known as a uh, steward battery grind. When we do a multi-axis spindle turning we don't have to stick to any particular type of axis. We start with the central axis but then after that it's free for all. You can use and turn some of the elements of the spindle turning using the parallel axis, then move it to a twisted axis, then combine different types of twisted axis and ang twisted angles that they have to each other in comparison to the central axis. So possibilities are endless. The thing is that you need to know what is the end result, what is the outcome that comes out of each of those turnings in order to have a control over the turn piece instead of the form being random and chaotic and you have no idea what will come next. So that's why we're gonna cover a lot of those basic forms, how to make them and then all you need to do is use those, combine them and make something beautiful. The spindle that I'm turning is belonging to the fourth quadrant, circular type outcome and twisted axis. What happened here is that on the headstock end of the spindle we have three axis placements and they are all separated by 120 degrees among each other, where on the tailstock end they all get into a one point that lays on the central axis. I start turning by mounting the piece at the headstock on point one and I turn a bit uh, through the air wood until I get into the solid wood and then uh, the bit cross section is actually a circle. Then I'm remounting the piece on the second axis and also I am going through a solid wood to make another bead that has an outcome of a circle. Then I'm mounting the, the spindle on the third axis and I do a V-cut all the way through the so, to the solid wood. So then at that point also the outcome is circular. And at the end I'm mounting the uh, whole piece uh, between the centers on the central axis and I'm doing the final V-cut. That also because it's going through the solid wood is having a circular type of an outcome. The arc type of an outcomes are happening when you are turning a lot of air wood or ghost wood, where the circular type of outcome is happening when you cut too deep into the air wood, so now you're reaching on the new axis on only a solid wood, so there's no air, and then the cross section at that point on the new axis will be a circle. In this demo, I'll try to cover all the bases, all the basic cuts that you do, and then at the end we'll do a combination of some of those to get a more complex forms. Spindle is a part of the first quadrant spindles, where we have two parallel axes and arc type of an outcome. The uh, difference here is that I do two coves on each of the axes uh, which are kind of like getting closer to each other at the middle of the spindle and pulling apart at the left and right of it.
the spindle is using again parallel axis and arc type of an outcome the parallel axis are laying on the same plane as the central axis but they lay on the opposite side of it and equally distance from it the turning is alternate coves which gives a zipper type of a look of the finished piece What we have here is a spindle that belongs in the second quadrant where we had an, the arc type of an outcome and twisted axis. What we see here is that the piece had four axes on each side and they are labeled one through four and we do two mountings or two turnings on this piece. We turn the first turning is uh, on the number one on the headstock and number two on the tailstock and then the second turning is on number two on the headstock and number three on the tailstock because each of those are 90 degrees when we do a form like that we actually get a visual twist and arc type of an outcome along the whole spindle. we have here is a spindle that has three axes on each side of the cylinder. Uh, they are all separated by 120 degrees and what we will implement here is an actual twist so we will not do a, a parallel turning, we will be doing a twist turning. So we are gonna go from a lower number on the headstock to the higher number of the, on the tailstock and uh, we'll do three ties, uh, three turnings so we'll go from one to two then the next turning will be two to three and the last turning three to one in each turning we'll be doing a bigger cove and the one end and uh, finishing the cove uh, slightly on the other side so what that will generate is a cr arc cross section that will be made out of three arcs since we're using three uh, multiple axes and also uh, looking at along the whole piece we'll see that there is a visual twist of the form starting from the bottom and finishing in the top 120 degrees off and that is because we apply that twist on the axis when we were turning them
At the end I'm putting the piece between the centers and I'm turning a decorative V-cut to make it look nice. The next spindle is representative of the third quadrant which has a circular outcome and parallel axis. It's quite a simple form. It can have a couple of parallel axis marked on each side of the cylinder. And what I'm doing here is actually using a thin uh, parting tool that I homemade to mark uh, the actual zones where I will use a little bit thicker parting tool to kind of go through the air wood into the solid wood until I reach uh, the solid wood on that axis and turn a cylinder there. Then I'm moving the whole spindle on another set of axes, parallel axis, and I'm doing the same. I'm turning through the air wood into the solid wood to get another cylinder and what I have to be very careful is the connection between that area and the previously turned area where I want a clean cut uh, which at the end will give me a shape of uh, like uh, uh, stacked cans put one on top of each other as a final form of the spindle. You have to be very careful here because easily you can cut into the previous cylinder and disconnect the piece and it things will start flying around. Don't even ask me how do I know that and if you went until the end of the video you may see the bloopers that I have uh, on a couple of the spindles that I was turning for this demo. So this piece came as a lucky accident in a way. It's a, one of the parallel axis circular type of an outcome pieces and uh, it was supposed to be a small figurine. What happened here is when I was doing the head or the second spinning, second uh, turning of the, the head, I actually went instead of uh, going with the spindle gouge to the support the fibers of the grain, I actually went uh, on the opposite uh, side, so against the grain, so I was lifting up a good portion of the, of the shavings and they were still attached to the head, which kind of reminded me of a, a hair 
So when I looked at the piece close to the end, it kind of reminded me of my grandmother, Nana. So I have that piece finished now and I put a small face, smiley face on it and it's uh, now I'm having my Nana uh, observing and looking me while I'm working in my shop. We have a representative of the fourth quadrant uh, with a circular type outcome and a twisted axis. What we have here is a spindle that has three axes on each side. Each axis is uh, separated uh, by 120 degrees from the other and we will apply a 120 degrees uh, twist along the length of the spindle by turning uh, number one at the headstock with number two on the tailstock and number two of the tail of the headstock to number three of the headstock and number three of the headstock to number one on the tailstock. So three turnings and in each turning we'll be doing a different uh, elements. Uh, with a circular outcome, which means that we have, to, I have to cut through the air wood and then end up in the, into the solid wood and make up the final form. So on the first turning, I will be turning two V cuts that I have to go through the air wood into the solid wood. Then on the second turning, I am turning uh, a cove going from the air wood into the solid wood. And then on the third uh, one, I will be doing a bead uh, that will finish the whole four. Here it is, the infamous hook tool, feared by many, befriended by few. And I believe those few have more fun than the others, but hey. Uh, it's very simple, a uh, couple of rules to follow by using the hook tool. Uh, when you apply the tool, you approach it with a 6 o'clock uh, flute, where there's no cut at that point, you turn clockwise to make this the flute around 630 you started seeing the shavings and at that point it's a pivoted turn uh, following the curve of your of your vessel and riding the bevel of the hook tool uh, all the time uh, you have to be careful it can be very uh, grabby and uh, if it's not applied correctly especially with the pivot movement of the handle and if that's too much trouble on a smaller openings like this one then you can also use it as a scraper by putting it as a 6 uh, 630 uh, position with the fluid and uh, pulling the tool along the surface towards you
So what we have here is a type of a multi-axis uh, turn goblet. So first I use the hook tool to hollow the inside of the goblet uh, cup and now uh, I'm going into making the outside walls of it. This will be multi-axis uh, turning with a twisted axis and uh, circular outcomes. What I'm doing is uh, uh, the twisted axis, there are three of them and they all end up on the central axis or they start from the central axis where the item is uh, uh, chucked on the headstock and they go and spread uh, towards the tailstock. I'm not using the tailstock because this piece is too small so there's no need for it. Uh, what happened is that the cup is turned on the center and then when that's done and I'm happy with the thickness of the walls I'm gonna go and move the uh, offset the piece by releasing it from the chuck and just twisting the whole form a little bit in the chuck jaws. Uh, then it's all just kind of like variation of the same uh, theme. I'm doing that for the second and for the third one. I'm doing V cuts and uh, at the end uh, I'm parting the tool off. So here we have another goblet uh, type of a multi-axis turning and uh, the original I saw online and it was called uh, bourgeois, excuse my French, maybe I didn't pronounce it well, but it actually means uh, candle holder on French and uh, the French wood turners um, do a lot of offset turning from what I have noticed because a lot of sources and good sources about wood turning uh, multi-axis uh, spindles comes from uh, French wood turners. We have a multi-axis turning on a twisted axis and the outcome is the circular outcome. What happened is uh, that the twisted axes are converging into one point and uh, they cross over the central axis of the material at the chuck uh, holding point on the headstock. Uh, we have only two axes here uh, instead of three like in the previous one. First I'm using the hood tool to hollow the form of the goblet because I didn't want it to use it for candle holders. I like it as a more as a, like a drinking cup so that's why I use more like a spherical opening inside and after I'm done with that I'm uh, doing uh, the outside of the cup and that's also done only on the central axis. Um, at that point I'm also doing the first form below the cup which is a big cove uh, that goes very close to the thin stem of the actual cup and uh, when I'm happy with that shape I'm unmounting the piece from that uh, central axis and I'm putting in on the first multi-axis which is uh, just moving the whole form in the chuck 
therefore 15 to 20 degrees in relationship to the central axis. Don't be scared of the propellers. I mean, it's, these pieces are small and uh, they look on camera and in real life scary when they turn, but they are not that dangerous. Uh, even that you have to work with the very high speeds when you're doing the multi-axis turnings. Um, usually my speed is above 2000 and up to 3.5 thousand uh, RPMs when I'm doing these guys. Uh, the faster the better because it's you're working with a lot of air wood and uh, you're gonna get a lot of chatter or uh, uneven surface if the speed is very low. starting with uh, small V cuts to kind of end up with another big uh, uh, cove uh, that will actually go also inside the previously turned cove and make a very interesting shape. I'm cutting inside the ghost wood until I reach the solid wood so that's where the circular outcome comes in place. I'm going towards the third segment of that by dismounting the piece from the chuck and uh, putting it 30 degrees on the other side of the central axis or any other relationship to the central axis if you don't want those uh, small coves and new forms that are happening to be kind of like symmetrical we can use any axis that we want there's no rule on this one so then the third cove is turned up and uh, when the shape of that one is okay, I just kind of like put it back on the central axis and part out the item and that's pretty much it. It's worth to say that with multi-axis turnings, especially these random ones, you need to, if you want to have a finished piece, you have to sand and seal and uh, uh, polish everything while you are in the axis that you're working on. There's no time and there's no way that you are gonna get the same axis back if you kind of like finish the whole piece and want to remount it to kind of go backwards. So um, be careful of that because you know you may have something wonderful but it will be unfinished because you didn't have you know you didn't do the uh, process properly at uh, you know while we were working on it. This is a small parting tool, very thin, 116th I believe, and I custom made that. I got uh, the piece of the high speed uh, steel metal and I grind it to a negative rake uh, angle, probably around 70 degrees, uh, so it works really fine. Uh, this is where you actually, I'm using the Japanese uh, pull saw to part the whole thing and here it is. Alright guys, you survived so far, congratulations, we have two more projects to go and uh, this I'll go a little bit slower with them, not so that fast because these ones that I liked more and so I'll put more attention on explaining what's happening here. So we're talking about 14-15 inches uh, a long piece of wood. 
The male figurine is turned on only one multi-axis aside from the central axis and that multi-axis is at the headstock and it's only half an inch away from the central axis. Here I'm marking the areas for the top of the figurine and the rim of the head, then the head and this is the body part the torso part and then below it there will be the legs, uh, that it will be the leg part, the legs part. And this is the third uh, marks and I'm using a parting tool because I have to get all the way to the solid wood and get a circular outcome. So that's the head that you're seeing and now I'm working on the head using only parting tools because there's no reason for anything else and now I'm going towards the body which has a conical shape. I turn down to the pretty much close to the end the diameter at the bottom of it with a parting tool and now I'm doing just a uh, bevel supported cut with a spindle gouge and I'm trying to get a straight form. That will not be the actual torso, that's why I will have to turn the neck for the head at the top of that uh, conical part and what I'm doing here is I am uh, making a uh, half a sphere, that will be the start of the leg part. So now it's a little sending. I am using Yorkshire grid as an abrasive paste and then the Hampshire shine for the polishing. And while on the small screen you see me doing this boring part, uh, here on the other screen, the big screen, I'm actually ma uh, marking the bottom and uh, I'm kind of like just uh, isolating that area, but then I will go back to making the neck part of the of the torso and the head, the connected part. So this is uh, done on the center axis. So you have to be very careful here because you may get too much into the head part and then it may not look really good, but I was lucky. so. It ended up, ended up really nice. And with that, that done, you have to kind of also sand, polish and everything there if you want to preserve the piece. I'm taking down the bulk of the material to form the legs and they have to be very thin so it's a lot of spindle turning and measuring to see you have to be careful at the top part here because uh, that's where the beginning of the legs will happen and uh, there's a small interesting shape that will mark the front part and the back part of the legs You can go more aggressive here, but since we have a lot of thin parts uh, on the upper body of the figurine, too much pressure here may cause a break on the other side, so that's why I'm using the spindle turn, spindle gouge here instead of like using the ball gouge, uh, just to avoid using too much power and uh, weaken the neck part and maybe the kind of like the, the waist part, which is really thin and uh, uh, fragile at this point. So this is close to the end of the leg part. Again, 
finishing with abrasive paste and polishing paste should be done at this axis uh, before taking the whole piece off and parting it out. Finishing a small thin base here before I apply the parting tools and completely remove the form. So this is preparation for parting it all. I'm using a thin parting tool to make the top of the hat and actually adding the bottom uh, with the relief uh, cut first. So I have a double uh, size of uh, for the parting tool and I'm ending up here with a Japanese pool saw because it's easier for me to control it that way. I'm still not there of catching it up and ruining it in the very end. So, you see, clean, nice, here, we're taking the hat, and that's it. And that's our little guy. So the last project for this demo is the female figurine and I have drawn the basic shape of her. So here I am uh, drilling up to the depth of the underskirt uh, using the drill bit and continuing the uh, hook tool. So as you said before, 6 o'clock uh, orientation does not do anything but then as soon as you move it to 6.30 it starts uh, doing the cut. Uh, mostly for uh, parabolic uh, type of uh, openings you need to do a pivotal uh, turning of the handle but here because I have very narrow space that I have to hollow I'm actually using the hook tool as a scraper which does a very good job uh, just uh, you know the, the quality of the surface after that is not as good as uh, if you do it with the uh, bevel supporting cut and a pivoting turn of the handle. I'm going deep maybe four or five inches uh, here and using the scraping cut measuring a little bit and then I will be going towards the outside of the of the skirt. So for the outside turning, I am using my ball gouge uh, 4040, uh, using the push cut to fastly remove uh, most of the material, and then I'm going downhill uh, using a bevel supported cut uh, to, with the supported fibers uh, and uh, getting a very clean cut that requires a very little sanding after that. So constantly measuring the thickness of the skirt so I don't want to kind of make it as a mini skirt of course and uh, still kind of like doing the conical shape of the skirt which comes into very uh, tiny diameter before it goes into the hip part of the figurine. I'm going towards the widest part of the hip 
So I'm reducing material to get closer to that diameter and then get a nice transition between the thin part of the skirt towards the white part of the hips. Again, cutting with the supported fibers, not against the grain, but with the grain to get a very clean and uh, nice cut that requires very little sanding. So this is the curve going towards the waist of the figurine. So now we have a thin waist. That's the upper torso part. So far everything is turned on the central axis. And uh, we'll be turning this figurine on two additional axes, but those uh, turns are actually to reduce uh, some of the parts of the uh, hips and on the upper torso to kind of make it more naturally looking. So now I'm going into the first uh, multi axis, which will actually reduce the torso part in that area that I'm pointing and make it flatter, which will on its own be the actual spine part of the figurine, or the back of the figurine. Very light cuts, a lot of ghost wood going on here, and very light cuts are needed because anything fast, it can actually damage the piece because it's kind of like very thin in some places, and it will not uh, survive too much chatter or too heavy of a cut. The area where the two shapes are connecting, the hips part and the lower part of the torso is uh, very crucial to be done uh, nicely because uh, it will be very noticeable at the end if it's not properly uh, turned. You see there's a small residue there, I'm trying to take that off but I don't want to go inside the hip part because then uh, it will be too much trouble to fix that. It's tough to see what you're doing with a lot of ghost wood, so a lot of it is just kind of to it by intuition and following and looking at the at the uh, ghost uh, images that are spinning like with 2,000, 3,000 RPMs in front of you, which is not very easy. So at this point, I'm trying and I'm seeing that I have set it up wrongly and I would cut the uh, piece in the wrong place so now I'm getting again checking out what I will be actually cutting and that is a nice way to figure out what will happen when you start turning it before you make a mistake so at this point I'm actually reducing the hip part to make an area that will uh, be the stomach part of the, of the figurine so the stomach part is on the opposite side of the spine part that I reduced uh, just before on the other axis. So this axis laying on the same plane with the central axis, just there at uh, the same distance from the central axis opposing each other. Now is the most interesting part, the sending, you know, but I'm kind of like showing this part only because I want to say that you don't use a late turning while you're sending, you have to do it uh, by hand just to kind of preserve those crisp lines that are happening on the stomach and on the spine area. So now we're going back to the central axis and I will be turning the neck and the head of the figurine. Again, using the push cut to reduce most of the materials with the bull gouge and then doing a small cove for the neck and a bead for the, for the head. So 
very tiny space here you need to carefully approach it because a little catch from the wings on the spindle gauge can dislodge this whole piece and get it flying across your shop and you'll have to start it all over again So at this point, we're pretty, I'm pretty much done. So I will continue towards uh, parting the whole figure in out uh, from that top part because it will not be used for the hat. I will be turning the hat for this figurine uh, from a separate, separate piece of wood and that comes next. Here's the figurine, that's the frontal view, that's the side view, so you have everything looking really nice. And we're gonna go towards making the hat. I used the small maple piece that I had and uh, I'm turning it into cylinder here, flattening it uh, on the top part and I will be turning a tenon there so I can put it in the chuck. I'm using one-way chucks so actually I have only one one-way chuck so I'm using the not a dowel but it's kind of like the square type of a tenon because that's what the, the jaws of my one-way are and if you can see I'm tiny I have turned the tenon so close to the fully closed jars on the on that chuck and that's is the best grip that you can get. If the jars are too open, the grip is not that well because it's not holding the whole uh, tenon, it's wrapping it in an eighth uh, point instead of like much more than what you have here with the almost closed chuck. So you better try to get your tenons as close to the close uh, position of your chucks. Here I am hollowing the insides of the hat and I'm testing it out, fitting it out to see if I'm happy and I'm doing a final slicing cut with my uh, spindle gouge to get the best surface I can. I'm getting a waist wood mounted on my one-way chuck, I'm getting it ready for mounting the hat and I'm happy with that. It's a little bit loose but I'm using a double stick tape here uh, to fit it and it looks good so now I'm reducing the thickness of the hat because I want to for it to be very thin uh, using slicing cuts and uh, then I will continue towards making the dome part of the hat or the top of the hat. So I'm using here a uh, razor to dismount the head from the waist block. I have to be very careful because it's very thin, maybe one three twos uh, or even less. And I don't want to break it at this point. Luckily everything went okay. And after removing the double stick tape, here's the hat. What I did after that, I colored it black with the India ink and I attached it uh, to the figurine. Thanks for watching and staying me for the last hour. Here's the final look of the 
male and a female figurine uh, finished uh, with a sanding sealer and uh, abrasive paste and polishing paste and uh, the hat on the female was colored in black in the ink. For the ones who are still awake, here are a couple of bloopers that I had during the making of the videos for this demo. I cannot stress enough how important it is to have uh, your face shield when you're turning, especially with the multi-axis turning, the speeds are very high, you're talking about 3000 RPMs and uh, most of these pieces that got dislodged actually hit my face shield so it wasn't funny it was very stressful so be very careful guys i'm not trying to scare you but still keep your beautiful faces intact So once again, thanks for staying with me, thanks for watching and I hope to make more content for you guys and please be safe.